Now, the archive hour. As Broadcasting House here in London undergoes a massive refit to bring it into the 21st century, David Hatch, former controller of Radio 4 and managing director of radio, takes a tour of his old stomping ground to discover how and why this historic building has always been known as the home of radio. This is London calling. Broadcasting House, or BH, as it is known to all in the BBC, is the home of the radio family, of which I was the paterfamilias in the early 90s. It was a gloriously eccentric building full of nooks and crannies, cubicles and corridors, myths and legends. It seems to have been there, or thereabouts, at every significant moment in our recent past, and has a history that stretches way beyond its 70-plus years. Our BBC is you. It's the latest phrase. Built in 1932 by architect Val Mayer, when it first opened its doors, it was described as the new Tower of London and was originally designed to look like the skyscrapers of New York. A perfect specimen of Art Deco design, it's a building that inspires everyone who walks through its impressive and awe-inspiring doors. I loved it, as do those two wonderful broadcasters, Sue McGregor and Libby Purvis. I adore this building. I have many, I have you know, decades of memories of making programs here, either live or recorded programs. And I remember before he was Foreign Secretary, when I think he was still in opposition, Jack Straw once said to me, as a politician, it, it was a great sense of occasion coming through the front, those yeah. great big heavy... Reception, wonderful. ...grass front doors into reception. This temple to the arts and muses. Do you know, that still gets me. It really, it still gets me. A lump in the throat. You know, even when you're, you're coming here for, for the sort of lowest of reasons or the most frivolous of programmes, you think, yeah, it's a temple to the arts and muses. It is. This is where Lord Reith lives. This is where he has, his ghost has retreated to once more. The wider BBC is a dreadful jungle of celebrity sleepovers with Vanessa Feltz and God knows what else over in the television service. But here in this building, you know, Reith still walks the corridor. Corridors. Um, it, it just does have that numinous quality about it. I couldn't agree more. And as I returned to the building after so many years, from the outside at least, it still looks as impressive as it did when I first arrived there 30 years ago. Now undergoing a massive redevelopment to cope with the new demands of broadcasting, the building doesn't look anything like it did in my day. The corridors are gutted and bare, ready to be transformed into a new modern home of radio. But as we take a tour of this historic building, the old ghosts and memories are still very much alive. The myths and legends that surround it begin before you step through the front doors, as I discovered from two people closely involved with the new development, Robert Seater and Andy Crawford. Robert Seater, we're standing at the entrance of this fantastic and, I think, very beautiful Art Deco building in white Portland stone. And as we enter, there's a statue above us of two figures. Who are they? This is a wonderful statue of Ariel and Prospero, who are two key figures from Shakespeare's last play, The Tempest. Prospero was a sort of magician figure who was sent to an island, and Ariel was the spirit of the air, an appropriate personification for the spirit of broadcasting, which is why the BBC commissioned it. BH, as we all call it, is surrounded by myths and legends. And this begins almost as we go in underneath this statue, because this is surrounded by myths and legends. Tell me, the, the first one concerns the size of Ariel's willy. I would like to put it to the Home Secretary that he should instruct the police to compel the Directorate on the British Broadcasting Corporation to remove immediately the statue recently placed over the front entrance of Broadcasting House in Portland Place on the grounds that it is objectionable to public morals and decency. There was huge contention and outcry when this statue was finally installed in 1933. It was thought to be an absolute affront to public morals. There is no exact science as to whether the, the penis was reduced or not, but I went up there when we were doing the cleaning of the statues, and it doesn't look that big to me. So perhaps it was snipped after all. Charlie Chilton, the writer of Journey into Space and Oh What a Lovely War, who joined the BBC in 1933 at the age of 14 as a messenger boy, 
witness Gill at first hand and told me about some of his more eccentric behaviour. It wasn't just Ariel and Prospero that caused offence. They put this scaffold up for him to start carving Prospero and Ariel and he had the habit of wearing a monk's cassock with a girdle round it and nothing else. And people, as they walked into Broadcasting House, used to look up at this kind of <laughs> lattice work that he stood on and got a terrible shock because he didn't wear anything underneath. And the girls used to complain that they daren't come into the entrance of Broadcasting House, because, you know, for fear of... Of course, they didn't have to look up, but apparently some of them couldn't resist it. <laughs> he had a few other surprises up his sleeve. The BBC may have thought they commissioned Prospero and Ariel, but Eric Gill had other ideas. Although the BBC commissioned Ariel and Prospero, he said in an undertone, they think they have commissioned Ariel and Prospero, but actually they have commissioned God and man. And when you get close up to the statue, you see that Ariel, the front figure, is actually on his hands, bears the stigmata. You can't see it very well because one of the hands is carrying a pipe, but actually it is a statue of God and man rather than Ariel and Prospero. Andy Crawford, when we look at Prospero and Ariel, or God and Man, as Gill would have it, front on, we're not seeing all that Gill carved. Like many sculptors and artists, he rather cheekily, and that I think is an appropriate word, added something of his own, didn't he? And he thought it would only be revealed to posterity, and that's also an appropriate word, isn't it? There's a lovely report in the Evening News in 1933 who talked to Gill as he was perched above... Uh, the entrance of Broadcasting House, and he revealed that the statue which had been begun in his studio uh, had been drawn upon by a friend of his. A girl's face had been drawn on what turned out to be Prospero's bottom. And Gill said, it was such a nice face, I carved it there. And when the statue was put into the niche that you refer to, he said, it'll be there, no one can see it, and it'll be there until Broadcasting House is not down. Well, last year, whilst the statue was being cleaned as part of the new development, Andy was able to climb up to see if the legend of Gill and the mystery girl is true or just another BH myth. Here's what happened. We come up onto the scaffolding that's still in place just above the main reception doors to Broadcasting House and we've come armed and equipped with a very sophisticated device made up for us by the BBC's mechanical workshops consisting of a large A4 mirror stuck on a piece of wood which we're going to stick behind the statue to see if we can find out whether Eric Gill did indeed carve the face of a girl onto the back of the statue of Prospero. Malcolm's on the other side. Are you there, Malcolm? Yes, I am. Excellent. Okay, if you start passing the mirror around, let's see what we can see. Hold it. Whoop. Hold it there. Fantastic. It's there. It's actually genuinely there. There is the face of a girl carved, very simple relief, carved onto the back of Prospero at around bottom height, mid-length hair, a couple of eyes, nose, obviously a reasonably rough sketch from a sculptural point of view, but very definitely, as Gill said he'd done, the face of a beautiful girl, and it's been there for over 70 years. The mystery still remains, however, of who this girl is. But at least one BH myth turns out to be true. You know, just looking at this amazing building, you do get a real sense of history. A feeling for those early days of radio, of Lord Reith's vision for the BBC. And it's that sense of history that makes this building so special to everyone who has worked in it over the years, including John Humphreys. The point of a broadcasting house, BH, and nobody ever called it broadcasting house, the point about BH was that it had been there from the beginning. It is the BBC. It was there at the start. One well, prays it'll be there at the end, however long the end may be in coming. But you really, you couldn't go in to Broadcasting House. You couldn't enter that magnificent portico without thinking, you know, th there's history here. And everything about it spoke of the history. It was grubby, of course it was. It was inefficient, grotesquely inefficient. Of course it was. But it was where broadcasting, real broadcasting, began. This is the National Programme from London. Nowhere do you get a more telling feeling for those early years of broadcasting than in the huge reception. 
Good evening. Good evening. I have an appointment with Mr. Green. Oh, yes. Thanks so much. Uh, is it rehearsal? Yes. Thank you. Studio 3B, please. 3B. Yes, thank you. Good evening. Oh, good evening. Uh, may I leave this letter, Mr. Cullen? Oh, yes, certainly. Would you mind taking it to the desk the other side of the hall? Oh, Thanks. by the way, uh, which the studio? Uh, children of the studio? Uh, wait a minute. Uh, B, B, please, downstairs. Thank you. I always felt if you sat in reception for a week, you'd see everybody who was anybody. Politicians, writers, musicians, comics, scientists, philosophers, arriving at the temple to the arts and music. In winter time or summer time, or leisure time and pleasure time, the daily times and big men chimes are radio times. Radio had been going for just 10 years by the time the BBC moved into BH in 1932. Before that, they'd camped at studios at Savoy Hill, and although these quickly became too small, there was a real sense of sadness as they left those studios for the last time. Well, Oliver, I suppose this will be about the last time we'll be pulling down that old iron gate of yours for me. Yes, sir. It's really easy, end of Savoy Hill. No. Here it goes. Good night, Good, Good night, sir. Good night, sir. Good luck to all, sir. So they came from Savoy Hill to here. I mean, loving this building as I do, I was astonished to read that when they all moved here from Savoy Hill, they didn't like it at all, including Weath. They, I mean, why was that? They absolutely hated it, by all accounts. Savoy Hill had been this wonderful, evolving, ramshackle building. There was a real camaraderie, backs against the wall, inventing things as you went along. Broadcasting House, by comparison, was a very formal, cold, austere building. Lots of long corridors, doors, and it didn't live up to expectations. The studios were felt to be too small. The acoustic insulation between them didn't work as well as could be expected. Bands playing in the basement could be heard in the concert hall. The large organ in the concert hall could be heard in the studios above. Everything was wrong, and it was too small. The day they moved in, they found they'd run out of offices, and they started getting the builders back in to move walls and to move doors, and there was banging and there was noise. And that Which has gone on ever since. Oh, absolutely, yes. And John Reith was called in, he was, he was almost forced by his management to come in to call an all-staff meeting to calm the staff down. And given how difficult it was to record things in those days, it's quite amazing that the recording survives of Reith talking to his staff. And ironically, halfway through this wonderfully motivational please bear with us speech, you can hear banging as the builders break out behind him. Well now, with respect to this building, as Admiral Carpenter has indicated to you, there may be some things, there may be many things about it with respect to which you are disappointed and with respect to which you may be suffering some inconvenience. Would you be good enough to bring to the inconveniences a good heart? Because then I think you will find that they are lessened, if not eliminated, and you will be happier yourself. Having moved from Savoy Hill to here, they didn't actually believe that they were going to use all this building, did they? Uh, they thought it was much too big, and that proved not to be the case. No, the first plans showed that they wanted to use the ground floor for shops and retail, and the foyer we're standing in was originally designed to be a bank, which probably explains a little bit about the very formal banking field. It, it looks a bit like a bank. Doesn't it? And that long counter over there they've now put in. There is a wonderful clause in the original lease which says that we're not allowed to undertake certain businesses. We're not allowed to uh, be a butcher, purveyor of meat, slaughterman, fishmonger, sugar baker, common brewer, what? tripe boiler, tripe seller, fried fish shop, coal shed keeper. Well, we've broken that it, clause sorry. anyway. I mean, there's plenty yeah. of tripe goes out of this building. Absolutely. For Christmas time, the party time, for dinner time, or dancing time, the daily time that big men chimes are radio times. Day. On the front cover of Radio Times, I'm sure regularly, was Henry Hall. Hello everyone, this is Henry Hall speaking and tonight is my guest night. It is now my very great pleasure to welcome back to my program that supreme artist that we all love so much, ladies and gentlemen, Gracie Fielding. But the most popular program on the airwaves in the 1930s was Bandwagon. Bert, 
switch it over to the regional. Bandwagon will be on now. Oh, so it will. Bandwagon, come on and take a trip upon the bandwagon. It's a wild and boy's piece of grand wagon. Come on and take a trip and pull the bandwagon. Starting now. Starring Arthur Askey and Richard Stinker Murdoch, the series owed much of its popularity to the mythical flat location where the characters were supposed to live on the eighth floor of Broadcasting House. Richard Stinker Murdoch reminisces. I was invited to be in a new radio series, and it was called Bandwagon. And uh, I thought that it was a bit of a come down after all this television, but it turned out to be a great breakthrough. The BBC's idea was to have a variety show with a difference. There was to be a resident comedian, and uh, the one finally chosen was a little man they discovered in a concert party on the Isle of Wight called Arthur Askey. And we invented this mythical flat on the top of Broadcasting House, where we lived with a goat and pigeons, and it became an instant success. We were in this flat above Broadcasting House, and here we are giving it a spring clean. I say, Dickie, this is filthy. Well, we'd better get a loose cover for it. I'm not going to have anything loose in this flat. <laughs> well, what about the chandelier? That's been loose ever since we've been here. You'd better be careful how you dust it. Oh, that's all right. This chandelier has been in my family since it was a nightlight. Mm. Nevertheless, <laughs> it's loose. I think we'd better leave it to Mrs. Bagwell. Who's Mrs. Bagwell? The woman who's come to help us with the spring cleaning. There's a lump here. What? I think something slipped down the back of the settee. Well, what is it? Come and give us a hand to get it out. Right. Oh, it's the piano. <laughs> Oh, that's where it got to. No wonder we couldn't find it the morning after the party. I'd better dust it, I think. Yes. Oh, oh, oh. We're now in a fantastic space called the Concert Hall, at least it was. It's now, I think, the Radio Theatre, right in the centre of Broadcasting House. It is a massive space. When I was a producer here, we used to have various satellite theatres around West London. One was the Playhouse and one was the Paris, and we moved light entertainment into here. And it didn't work because the space is almost too big. What is it going to be used for now? Is it it's still going to be for light entertainment and music, or what? It's had a very chequered existence over the years. It started off as being a theatre for classical music, but it never really worked, part of the reason being that the acoustics are compromised by the rumble of the tube that infects the whole building. As you say, in the 90s, early 90s, it was converted into a light entertainment venue, and again, that didn't really work. No. The place was rebuilt, so the reverberation time was reduced for, for speech. The, the large organ at the far end of the concert hall was always a problem. It was far too loud. It would break up through the studios immediately above. The main news studios used to be just above it, and I remember occasionally myself, I was reading the midnight news, and you could hear somebody practising beneath you, the, the organ coming up between your knees as you were intoning sort of tales of death and destruction across the world. As I've mentioned, I'm most familiar with this space as a venue for comedy. In the early 90s, the concert hall was adapted for light entertainment. And one of the first programmes to make use of this space was Just a Minute, which I produced, hosted by my old friend, Nicholas Parsons. It's a lovely atmosphere, but acoustically it's been designed for music. And you want the sound to drift up like that and drift over the head of the people. With comedy, you want the sound to go straight into their ears so you get a good uh, humorous reaction. And I used to feel, and I think others will confirm this, that when we worked there, we felt we were really having to work very hard to get the laughs from the audience. And yet when you heard it played back, because of the recording quality of that studio, the laughter sounded great. Stephen Fry, will you take the next round? And the subject we've chosen for you is Wilhelm Furtwängler. Can you tell us something about... <laughs> I'm sure it's been specially chosen for you, but there are 60 seconds to keep going, if you can, starting now. Well, Wilhelm Furtwängler was noted chiefly for his interpretations of Wagner, the great German composer of opera and so forth. Uh, he performed many times at the Salzburg Festival, where he'd get quite a reputation, got quite... Uh, oh, my God, I'm <laughs> Do you know... 
It's a lot more difficult than it seems when you're listening on the radio. <laughs> My respect for Paul and Wendy and Derek, which was previously mm. a rock bottom. Yeah. <laughs> I, it's extraordinary. These people are brilliant. I don't know how they do it. I produced it for years, Stephen, and I didn't understand how they did it either. The hall is now being revamped to make it more suitable for modern-day audiences. Robert Seater explained to me what they're doing. We're putting in flexible rigs so that it can be used more easily for television as well as radio, and then we're going to expand the areas around it so there'll be a new public foyer, be a new cafe, a new box office. So hopefully this space, which has been a rather, rather secret, unknown space in the yeah. centre of London, will be much more accessible to uh, the local community, to audiences and visitors, and will be a resplendent. I think it was quite secret to lots of members of staff too, funnily mm. enough. Mm. I think they came in through Broadcasting House that we've just come uh, through reception. And then they came either side of this space, not really knowing what no. was in the middle. Mm. And I'm sure there were people here for 20 odd years who didn't know about this space. It is one of the secret spaces. <laughs> this was actually used during the Blitz. Um, what you had, you had a curtain down the middle, and you had male employees one side, female employees in the other, and that's where they sheltered during the Blitz. How sweet. That's wreath, I suppose, was it? <laughs> The hand of the studio clock points to 11.15. Down in the bomb-proof underground control room of Broadcasting House, an engineer turns a knob. Across the street, the woman puts down her cup of tea and moves towards her wireless set. I am speaking to you from the cabinet room at 10 Downing Street. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. The BBC programme departments have left London for their secret emergency studios and it'll take them several days to settle in down there somewhere in England. The idea is that if, as most people expect, war opens with a super blitz on London, we shall be able to carry on from these hidden radio cities. The orchestras and their instruments have gone, the secretaries and their typewriters, the producers and the piles of scripts, radio plays, variety shows, all have been loaded up and driven away into the country, leaving us at Broadcasting House to carry on with the news and Sandy and records and the news and Sandy. And news and Sandy and records and news and Sandy and records and news and Sandy. Right, we've just come along a, a long corridor full of wires and pipes and heaven knows what, uh, really into the bowels of the earth now. And we're entering a corridor. Actually, this is one corridor I don't think I've ever been in before in my entire life. Oh, good Lord. There's written into the wall, BBC AD 1942. Why was that put there? This is what's called, in um, a variety of different ways, the, the stronghold or the bunker. But basically, it was the space that the BBC built um, after the years of the Blitz, completed at the end of 1942, where they could house broadcasting should Broadcasting House be shattered and uh, fall to the ground. So basically, there's a complex of spaces here with incredibly thick walls, 22 inches thick, 10,000 tons of concrete were poured to create this structure. And inside, you had a little broadcasting station. You had four, four studios and cubicles. You had um, a place where the producer could sleep. Um, you had a, a rest area. And this is where broadcasting would happen. The government have given instructions for the following important announcements. Closing of places of entertainment. All cinemas theatres and other places of entertainment are to be closed immediately until further notice. 
During the war, Broadcasting House, of course, was a very important strategic asset, and there were defences put around it. There were fortifications put on the ground floor, the windows were sealed up, and inside as well there were gas-proof doors on all the doors. The control room, which was moved from the very exposed roof area where it was originally built, was very hastily rebuilt and expanded into the very basement studio. And there were wonderful photographs of home guard-type soldiers standing there with their bayonets and uh, notices saying, if you go past this without a pass, you will be shot. Plus, it was also apt covered in, in wall grease because being white and prominent and unusual shape was an obvious target for aircraft. So it was covered in grey grease, which, would, which was um, removed some years after the war with very heavy brushes. I mean, one of the reasons we have this stronghold down here is because, of course, the building was bombed in 1940. And I think we were live on the air at the time, were we not, Robert? We were. It was, it was the major hit. There were, it was one of three major hits. But in 1940, October, um, famously, the newscaster was reading the 9 o'clock news when a bomb hit the building. There was a slight pause, a second stutter, and then he proceeded with his The broadcast. show must go on. Absolutely amazing. This is the BBC Home and Forces programme. Here is the news... And this is Bruce Belfridge reading it. Tonight's talk after this bulletin will be by Lord Lloyd, the Colonial Secretary. The story of recent naval successes in the Mediterranean is told in the... I have not been informed of the discovery. A wise decision, I think, since the knowledge would have had, I'm sure, the most disturbing effect on my delivery. The studio where I sat was well below ground, and the only damage it suffered was the dislodgement of some plaster and a quantity of soot which temporarily obscured my script. I've frequently been accused of having made some audible comment at the time, the nature of which has varied in the reporting from the blasphemous to the obscene. I didn't. The voice which was heard was that of the duty officer in the corridor outside who just said, It's all right. I've often been asked to describe my feelings. Well, they were simply those of anybody in the services or out who was in danger with a job of work to do, too busy doing it to have time for the fear which came to one when unoccupied and powerless to retaliate. I must confess, however, to considerable relief when I found at the end that I was able to get out and join Roy Rich, who was on duty with me that evening, in a much-needed refresher. Refreshers were very much part of BH culture. And very much part of BH's history was Charlie Chilton, who was a first-hand witness to the bomb. I was on the roof, I, I was doing fire watching, and then quite, the, it was a bad night, the Langham had been hit, seen that the whole of Great Portland Street was on fire, and it was obvious that the Germans had dropped fire bombs in order to target Broadcasting House. And we were up on the roof there with our buckets of sand and things, uh, to put out incendiary bombs when suddenly we heard an express train coming and then we saw something appear it hit the side of broadcasting house which shook well, like an earthquake and that was all and the chap who was in charge of us an ex-admiral said we've been hit well it was obvious we had been hit <laughs> he said we was going to find the bomb so we went down and we found it by some miracle, it had come in through a window, through an office, through the office door, across the corridor, through another door, into the music library. This was a smart bomb. Absolutely. And uh, there it was, lying on the ground with its fins all bent, you know. And, oh, my God, you know, I was terrified. And anyhow, this, this, this admiral, he was full of, you know, he knew exactly what to do. All right, said Chilton, go and find a rope. We'll wrap it round the fins of it and drag it to the end of the building, so if it goes off, it'll do the least possible damage. Oh, my God, so off I went trying to find a rope, and I was pursued by the chief fireman, who wasn't a BBC staff. They were firemen who were hired to work during the raids in, in, within BH. And he, he, he caught me up and he said, Look, son, you go down, go down to every floor, tell everybody to get into the basement. I'll deal with the bomb. And so I was grateful for that. And I started to clear people. I got to the second floor where the gramophone library was on, and this bomb went off. And all the dust came out of the air conditioning ducts and everything. And uh, the whole of the 
the tower, as they called it, that's all the studios in the middle of Broadcasting House, all collapsed on each other and came to rest on top of the gramophone library. Seven people dead. And we spent most of the night trying to dig them out, including the DG. Gosh. He came as well. Wonderful he did that. Another part of BH culture was that people used their surnames only when answering the phone. One night, as the flares fell all around him, the fireman rang the duty office, and the voice at the other end said, Topping here. Well, it's bloody awful up here, the fireman replied. The awfulness had a profound effect on the nation and the BBC. The war absolutely changed the, changed the profile of the BBC enormously. It was a time when the nation desperately needed news of what was happening, but not only in the UK, also overseas. So it led to the creation of the Forces programme, uh, the expansion of the World Service, which by the time the war finished had expanded to 40 languages. But also we ha you had to keep the morale up in the home front. Mm. So that led, led to the creation of um, huge strands of very, very popular programming. It made the BBC much more popular, uh, popular music, popular comedy, Comedy, all these, um, and programs about gardening, for example, had their birth just, just during that period. Um, kitchen Front, um, programs about how you, you know, maintain domestic life, all came to being during the war years. In your garden, here is Mr. Middleton. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I suppose one of the most difficult jobs to explain over the wireless is the pruning of fruit trees. I've had a good many tries, but I doubt whether I've ever made much of a success of it. But in response to many requests, I'm going to have another try. The trouble is that the different varieties of apple trees... Out of the war we came with the Home Service and the Forces programme, which became the Home Service and then the Light programme. And very soon after, in 1946, along comes the third programme, the more cultural strand. That lasts very happily until 1967 when, in reaction to the pirate stations that had broken out across the North Sea, the BBC recasts everything and we end up with Radio 4, Radio 3, and Radio 2, and this new brash upstart as an opt-out of Radio 2, Radio 1. Just for fun, music, too much. And good morning, everyone. Welcome to the exciting new sound of Radio 1. As always... Not everyone accepts this brave new world of radio, including a rather morose David Dunhill, a famous announcer, saying goodnight on the home service for the last time. The time is just now ten minutes to twelve. This is David Dunhill. And this is the end of the home service for today and for all days. In one sense, I suppose we're like a bride on the eve of her wedding. We go on being the same person, we hope, but we'll never again have the same name. Tomorrow at 6.35 a.m. we become Radio 4 and in spite of DJ Chris Denning who's just appeared on television with a shirt carrying the words death to the home service uh, in spite of him we expect to live happily ever afterwards. So, goodbye, home service. Two of the best words in the British language and still I'm sure the only answer you can give to the question what is Radio 4? Two more words we shan't erase. Good night. So it's good night from him and hello again from me with Charlie Chilton, talking about the very essence of broadcasting, the piece of kit called the studio. Now, like hotel rooms around the world, they all look the same. But back in the good old days, the studios were designed to reflect the nature of the programming. Well, there was the talks studio. Yes, what was a talk studio? Well, like? it looked like a grand house's library. Right. There was a lovely, beautiful desk, a lovely chair to sit on, an imitation uh, fire in a very old fireplace, and the whole studio was surrounded by books. But if you tried to pull a book off, you couldn't. It was only the spines stuck on the wall. You know, it looked like a shelf of books, but it wasn't. The National Programme from London. Here is Mr Desmond McCarthy, who's going to give you his usual literary criticism. We are seldom in the right mood for reading poetry, and a little of it goes a long way. This is London Calling, and here is Harry Graham, who's going to tell you something about his aunts. Of all my aunts, and I have eight, a varied and a choice collection, the two I chiefly venerate and view with most affection. This is London Calling, now here is Miss V. Sackville West, who's going to describe to you a journey from Syria to Persia, Miss V. Sackville West. When I first told my friends that I was going to Persia, 
I discovered that to most of them, Persia was little more than a vague... The BBC romantic. cookery expert is now going to talk on cooking for beginners. Many of you who are experienced cooks have no idea how ignorant quite a lot of us can be. Take the word Blanche for instance. What about uh, a religious studio? What did a religious the reli studio... Yeah, the religious studio was 3E, which was directly above the concert hall, and that was rather grander. It, I'm not quite sure what they tried to achieve with it, because there was, I don't know, it looked, looked, to me it looked rather Eastern in it, its design. But the thing was that when a, a, a service was held there, and new every morning, and the uh, evening service was held there every day, they pressed a button and a cross was illuminated, an illuminated cross appeared on the wall. That turned it into a holy place. When they finished, they switched it off and the cross disappeared, so it was a studio again. Was it a consecrated studio? I mean, well, did they take it to that length? Well, so I understand they want... Wreath wanted it consecrated, and he got the Bishop of London in to do it. Right. And they were going through the ceremony, and halfway through the ceremony, apparently, the, the Bishop asked Wreath what was underneath this holy studio. So Wreath didn't know, so he sent someone down to find out. And so they came back and said, what's underneath here is the gentleman's lavatory. So the Bishop of London went home. He wouldn't do the concrete <laughs> consecration. <laughs> I'm sure the noise of the loos didn't interrupt the broadcasting, but all the studios from the very beginning were disturbed by the Baker Loo line and the Victoria line, and also the omnipresent phantom driller, who remains at large to this very day. The noises of Broadcasting House are, are famous because, of course, the Bakerloo line runs right underneath it and all the lower ground floor and sub-basement studios, S1 in the sub-basement, used to have the most amazing rumbling sounds when the tube went under. We all got used to it, and as studio manager, you just stick in a rumble filter and carry on with the programme unless the producer's that fussy. For a long time, because of this sort of obsession of subsequent managements in improving it, they were always banging. And in midweek, for years, we had phantom knockings all through the programme. And sometimes it used to freak out the more nervous guests, and I hated that. I didn't like them being made uncomfortable. And I just completely lost my temper one week and said, if you can hear this knocking, it's annoying as much as it's annoying us. This is the name of the controller. This is his address. Write to him. One of the things that anybody who's ever worked in a, in a live studio in Broadcasting House will tell you about is the Phantom Driller. The Phantom Driller really did exist. I'm honestly not making it up. Every listener to the Today programme who's been listening for more than five minutes will tell you that there were so many occasions in the good old, bad old days when you'd have to say in the middle of an interview, I'm terribly sorry about the noise, it's the phantom driller. Well, in the studio now is the leader of one such delegation, Mr Eugene Steiner, president of the Indian Association of Alberta. Thanks. Can you remind us first why you're worried about this new bill? The reason why we're here is uh, because of the... Um long-lasting relationship between the Imperial Crown and the... Indian I suspect, see, that there was a ghost. There probably was a ghost who wandered around the place with a drill and, and kind of made this huge noise. And when a genuine driller was happening, this ghost would join him. If I ever find that phantom driller, I think I'd probably hit him even all these years later. There was something, which you probably know more about than I, called... Uh, a knocking chit, yeah. which a producer, if she knew knocking was going to happen, this was the problem, of course, you never knew, um, could, had to uh, issue in triplicate, yeah. and somebody had to sign it. And then, I had to sign oh, it, too. <laughs> and then with that sort of notice, <laughs> the knocking and drilling would stop with luck about two hours after you'd gone off the exactly. air. Exactly. I had no power at all, really. <laughs> Some noises off, though, were deliberately created, and very cleverly, too. Let me take you riding with Harry Morris. Buy a coconut... Right. Cut it in halves, you see, and then dispose of the edible contents. Yes. If you don't like coconuts, just hard luck. <laughs> and then we have that noise, disembodied. Now, disembodied, so we want a body. So we should have a drum, and we should put some pebbles and, and uh, a cloth just to deaden the drum, and, and a few of this... Just gravel on top of the cloth, on right, top of the drum, right, which, which right. does the job, doesn't yes, it? Yes. Then we apply the coconut shells. Yes. 
there we have so instead of being disembodied we have a body now we would have if we had if it, all this business was on the drum we, we get a resonance yes. and so on so there we are so first we walk right, right. so and I should just add that we add to this the jangling of a bunch of keys. Uh, yes, your, to right, the effect. your keys. Thank you very much, John. Right. There we are. So, oh, come on then, boy. Come on. Walkie walkies. Right. Now into um, a walk, into a trot. Hup, hup. Canter. Then into the gallop. Stop here. We get to a fence, very high fence, and we can be as high as we like. Really? Right. Right. So okay. here we are in the gallop. You see, as high as you like, this fence can be. Make sure so we come down. Down we come. So the heyday of live studio effects gradually passed with records that came in and took their place. And then, of course, in the 50s, you were very much involved with the Goon Show, weren't you? And that must have made right. some quite considerable demands on the imagination, I should think, for their effects. It, it, Yes, I suppose it did, really, but it was all a very serious program, and you had to um, come up with the goods, you know. Um, if it said in the script, um, exploding boots, they boots that had to explode. Yes. And, there was no, and to give the feeling that they were boots in the process of, of disintegration. Yes. Or extracting people from upright pianos. Yes. You see? And and you say, well, and, and, and then Spike Milligan would say, are you sure that's an upright or is it a grand? You yeah. see, you'd have all these peculiar arguments going on right? and, and you'd have a, almost a committee meeting deciding on, is it a grand or an upright? What do you reckon? And exploding battered puddings and uh, all, <laughs> all, the, all the business. And they really had to sound what they were supposed to be. Next morning, my breast pocket phone rang. <laughs> Hello? Mr. Seacombe, Minnie's been hit with another batter pudding. Well, that's nothing new. It is. This one was stone cold. Cold? Yes. He must be losing interest in her. <laughs> there have been lots of firsts, obviously, broadcast from this building, Robert. Um, can, you, can you remember some of them or name some of them? You probably can't remember them. You're <laughs> young. I mean, there, there are so many things. I mean, radio was Broadcasting House. Um, the first programme actually broadcast here from here was on the 12th of March 1932 and that was a dance band full of popular favourites. But um, this was where the nation first held, first heard the, the major news announcements of the day, the Spanish Civil War, the Second World War, Churchill's broadcasts, De Gaulle um, broadcasting to the Résistance. L'honneur, le bon sens, l'intérêt supérieur de la patrie, Commande à tous les Français libres de continuer le combat là où ils seront et comme ils pourront. And this was where the nation first heard the voice of their monarch, so the raw broadcasts. The first, nation, the first broadcast to the nation and to then colonies was in 1932. It was, for, it was called the First Empire Christmas Day program and included a raw message from George V. Through one of the marvels of modern science, I am enabled this Christmas Day to speak to all my people throughout the Empire. And then the list goes on, all the popular comedies, Bandwagon, It's That Man Again, The Goon Show, Hancock's Half Hour, right down to Ro um, Round the Horn later, uh, later in the decades. Um, and then the popular music, like Music While You Work, Housewives, Choice, um, and some that still still last to today, so yeah. Desert Island Discs, um, Woman's Hour, Gardener's Question Times, they all came from this fantastic building. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful names for wonderful programmes. Mm -hmm.
It is amazing to think, as Robert was saying, about all these first broadcasts, that people had actually hadn't heard their own monarch uh, and hadn't heard these famous people live. I mean, all they could do is read about them. So I suppose it's not surprising when people were reading the news about these famous, amazing people that the country were going to hear for the first time, that they dressed up for it. I mean, they were in evening dress, weren't they? They did. There was an absolute protocol. So continuity announcers, which were a new breed then, all wore dicky bows and were all formally dressed. And it was part of the expected role of the broadcaster to, be, to take their role seriously and to dress accordingly. This is 2 LO calling. Here's the first news, copyright by Reuter, Press Association, Exchange, Telegraph and Central News. This is the BBC Home Service. Here is the news, read by Frederick Drysdale. This is the BBC Home and Forces Programme. Here's the news. This is Wilfred Pickles reading it. It's six o'clock. The news from the BBC with Peter Donaldson. Little Miss Bouncer alarms an announcer down at the BBC. She doesn't know his name, but how she rejoices when she hears that voice of voices. The whole of the Radio 4 audience, and I'm sure little Mr Bouncer, loved the incomparable announcer, Miss Charlotte Green. Really, if you do it well, you should be as unobtrusive as possible. Less is more. And I think you just need to indicate by the merest, subtlest hint in your voice that you've been amused by the programme that, that you've just heard, or surprised, or even aggravated by. Very subtle, very unobtrusive, unassuming, if you like. I think if you're doing it well, then people don't actually notice, really, that you were there. Absolutely tireless, sitting at the wireless. Poor little Miss B. It's the man who announces with such a lot of passion in it. The Daventry shipping forecast will follow in a minute. Little Miss Bouncer loves an announcer down at the BBC. The shipping forecast for today and tonight. Iceland, Bailey, Faroes. Fresh or strong southwest winds with gales in North Iceland at first. The shipping forecast I find fascinating, and I've only just gone back to doing some continuity announcing. And the big delight of that is doing the shipping forecast because it's the nearest thing to poetry that you get to read on Radio 4, and I love poetry. And it has um, a certain internal rhythm, and, and the cadences are beautiful. And I love reading that. Occasional showers with snow in the north, visibility otherwise good. Fair Isle, Cromarty, 40s. South to southwest gales, spreading from the west with rain and moderate or poor visibility. The forecast is crucial to our fishermen. Believe me, if the voice isn't crystal clear and the punctuation isn't exact, on the high seas, lives could be lost. Which is why on long wave it has two immovable, uninterruptible slots. Even the blessed test match special has to give way. Continuing our tour of the gutted BH, which guts me somewhat, we come to a legendary corridor. Robert, we've now come to the first floor of Broadcasting House, very ordinary-looking corridor, but there's some more myths along this corridor, aren't there? There are indeed. It's a very ordinary corridor with a very strange dead end, and at this dead end is purported to be the inspiration for Room 101 in George Orwell's novel, 1984. Nobody quite knows if this is the Room 101. George Orwell did actually work at the world. Uh, he worked at the BBC, actually at the nascent World Service, then called the Eastern Service, and he hated this time at the BBC. He described it as a mix of a girls' school and a lunatic asylum. Not a bad and, description. Yes, and he sat in lots of very tedious meetings. And so this, this is one Room 101. He also went to another Room 101 in 55 Portland Place, just around the corner, where he did sit in lots of very dreary meetings. Um, there's also another possibility that it was based on a room in his perhaps called childhood, where uh, a master with a cane uh, chased him through a room into a cold shower. So nobody quite knows at the end of the day which Room 101 is the right Room 101, but I suspect that it's a, it's a conflation of all these different sorts of spaces that, out of which Orwell created the horror of Room 101. He released Winston with a little push towards the guards. Room 101. It was bigger than most of the cells he had been in, but he hardly noticed his surroundings. All he noticed was that there were two small tables straight in front of him, each covered with green baize. One was only a metre or two from him, the other was further away, near the door. 
He was strapped upright in a chair, so tightly that he could move nothing, not even his head. The, the, the other reason why I, I, I like this as a, as a celebration of mythology, the idea of Room 101, is because this corridor which we just down, down which we just walked was where some very strange activity went on within the BBC. It was where a staff used to be vetted for any aberrant activity, which meant... But they were unaware of being vetted, weren't they? They, they were, which meant politics, sexual deviance, whatever. Yeah. And apparently files from members of staff who were thought to be slightly suspect had a Christmas tree put on them. Did they have stamps of different colours for uh, different kinds of vetting? You know? uh, not to my knowledge, they just had a Pink Christmas... for some sort of orientation. <laughs> a Christmas tree stamp, and that's all we know. Winston lay silent. He still had not asked the question that had come into his mind first. He had got to ask it, and yet it was as though his tongue would not utter it. There was a trace of amusement in O'Brien's face. He knows, thought Winston suddenly, he knows what I'm going to ask. At the thought, the words burst out of him. What is in room 101? The expression on O'Brien's face did not change. You know what is in room 101, Winston. Everyone knows what is in room 101. Andy, when you finally got to room 101, what did you find inside it? Christmas trees? Unfortunately not. The final reincarnation of Room 101 was as an air conditioning apparatus room and it was full of pipes and plumbing. But we did open the door and just facing the window was a solitary chair in all this darkness silhouetted against the light. It looked very spooky but it was obviously somebody just been in smoking. <laughs> Perhaps Room 101 is where the BH ghost went for a sit down and a fag. I don't think there's a ghost here. I know there's a ghost at Bush House because it came into a studio behind me and laid its hand on my shoulder at three o'clock in the morning and I turned round and the door wasn't even open or swinging. Um, so there's definitely a ghost there. There's supposed to be a ghost in the Langham, but actually the, the place which is now the Langham Hilton Hotel and which used to be the building where we were all sent over to try and get a few hours sleep in the night on night announcing shifts or news shifts or whatever, that's supposed to have a ghost. But I've never believed in that because all the people who've seen the ghost have been, to my knowledge, fairly sort of drunk at the time, or else drinking the dreadful Today programme old overnight shift cocktail of whiskey and night nurse. I really cannot recommend whiskey and night nurse. People were never that alert at half past six in the morning on that editing shift when they'd been on that stuff. I, I believe they all drink Evian water now over in West London and are very well disciplined, but in our day it was not so. And as I say, the people who saw the ghost were pharmaceutically challenged quite definitely. I've been respiratorily challenged climbing up to the roof as I come to the end of our tour. We have been walking through a fairly gutted building this morning, half of which I can't recognise from the 30 years I spent here, uh, and it's all being redeveloped and it's going to be wonderful. When will it be opened and what will be different? We're just starting the process of bringing the building alive. We're moving our radio operations out of the extensions built to the north of the building over the course of 2006, and by the end of this year, most of our operations will be in here with a view to demolishing those extensions for phase two of this, this big West One development. And the long-term aim is by about 2011 we'll have done two things. We'll have brought the BBC World Service in here from their current home in Bush House. We'll be moving out of Bush House. But we'll also be bringing over the television and radio newsrooms and locating them here as well, all on the same site. I wonder whether the new building will have as many myths and legends as the ones we've been talking about will this morning. Will you eradicate morning? those? <laughs> <laughs> I'm willing to bet it'll have as many builders. <laughs> yes, probably. I'm very interested to see what they do with the inside of it, to see if they're going to try and make it into something rather 21st century. I, I think the ghosts will kind of move in and uh, take it over and cut it up into matchboxes again. What goes around comes around. The staff from Savoy Hill hated BH to begin with, but learnt to love it, as Reith hoped they would, and as did John Humphreys. I hated the idea of joining the Today programme for one reason only, loved the idea for most reasons, but it meant going to Broadcasting House, and because I lived in West London, very close to Television Centre, I had to make the trek at that ghastly hour in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, all the way into the West End of London. But, of course, once you get there... You're in a different 
sort of world, really. It, it felt different. Everything about Broadcasting House was different from your normal kind of broadcasting centre. There was that sense of history. It actually permeated the place. You really could, you could feel it. You could feel it in the, in the walls. I know that sounds slightly overblown and a bit kind of emotional, but it's true there is something, there was something about the old BH that was quite different. And when eventually we had to leave the place after all those years, it was terrible. It was like leaving an old friend behind. You know, it was like abandoning your mother and father or something. It was ghastly. And uh, that's about it from us. Our editors today were John Carey and Jamie Donald. And if you thought we sounded a little bit depressed this morning, it's because we are moving the Today programme. This is the last one you shall hear from uh, Broadcasting House because tomorrow we will be coming to you from White City. I suppose I'd better not tell you what we call White City. Well, if BH wouldn't... is Broadcasting House is BH, we better BH. not. Yes, we better not BH. think about what White City is. Um, yes, it's a very very sad day. <laughs> <I hadn't laughs> You've just got that. it. You've just got it. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well done, yes. Very sad day. Um, this is a building um, whose very bones are soaked with the whole history and ethos of radio, well, isn't since it? Since the 30s. Absolutely. I remember when I first came in, I won't tell you how many decades ago, well, I was so yes. impressed I couldn't even open the front doors to this building. They're still well, pretty they hard a ton, to get through. But they now, they've now got those automatic openings, so if you're not careful, they smash you in the face. But, uh, yes. but it's going to be very sad because this is history, isn't it? The yeah. broadcasting house is history. Well, I, shed, I did shed a little tear this morning when I came in. Did and you? The, the commissioner offered his condolences and that was the most touching thing of all. I've never you know, seen you shed a tear in no, all the well, years. Well, there you I are. I keep you. it to myself. So there you are. Yeah. Oh, well, isn't that sad? Well, we all feel very We're going sad to open a it. bottle, though. We are. And the programme is not going to change. It'll come from a spanking new modern room with all sorts of horrible things in it. But it'll be the same programme. That's it. Coming next on Radio 4, Desert Island Discs. Today and the rest of news will, of course, be back in BH by 2011, along with the staff from Bush House who will no doubt be devastated to leave that warren of a building. But when they get to the new, improved broadcasting house, I'm sure, like their predecessors, they will create new myths and legends. Affection will grow, and the history that seeps from the Portland Stone will get into their souls, as it did for me. It won't be the same, but broadcasting house was not Savoy Hill. Broadcasting and the BBC must reinvent themselves constantly, or die. After 70 plus years, the battleship at the end of Regent Street needs a refit. And I hope, when complete, the staff will love it as we crumbling broadcasters loved our crumbling BH. It's the latest phrase. But Radio 4 Continuity is still here. The Archive Hour was presented by David Hatch. The producer was Alexandra Feacham. And if you'd like more information about the new, improved broadcasting house, then you can visit bbc.co.uk forward slash broadcasting house.